Canto 32 of Paradise, the penultimate canto of the Divine Comedy, deepens and extends Dante's understanding of Paradise that he's now seeing before him. And it does so by gathering in right across history, right across, I think, also his own experience of the Divine Comedy from the beginning of the Inferno, now right to the end of the Paradise. And by having that whole vision across time, across his own experience, inviting us to bring our own vision across time and across all of our experience, that is how what he sees here in Paradise can be fully understood. It's a vision that we must try and conjure, allow into ourselves as we read these verses. Another way of putting it is to use again these levels of meaning that Dante has deployed throughout. Um, they even more come into their own now. The levels of the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, the turning point, and then the anagogic as the divine vision itself subspecie eternitatis. And you can read this canto as it were through four times almost and get a sense for how it itself takes you into the fullest perception of the paradise that Dante is now gaining. So for example, read as a literal canto, this is a tour of paradise that Bernard takes Dante upon it describes the tears of the mystic rose of the divine heavenly amphitheater and you see how there's lots of difference lots of differentiation here in paradise this is the multiplicity in unity but it is also multiplicity and the literal mind can wrestle and struggle with that you know why is one soul here when another soul is there um, if you accept the Christian story in a fairly straightforward way, you might expect to see Mary sat in a high point, full of light. But then the cantor also tells you that Eve is there right alongside her. And so that makes you think, you know, what am I being invited to contemplate here? The allegorical sense of that, to push to the second level, would say, ah, this is about seeing the end and the beginning and how ends and beginnings in salvation history are tied together. What seemed like Eve's fall becomes Mary's incarnation, the restoration which is also the fulfilment of humanity in divine life. This great sense of return which isn't a rescue isn't the Gnostic understanding of being trapped in creation and so needing escape. Rather, it's an unfolding. It's seeing creation as the multiplication, the expansion, the freedom to enjoy the divine life more and more and more, become more and more reflections and refractions and expressions of this divine fullness. So the allegorical understands Eve and Mary put together. Um, as you read through, follow um, Bernard's uh, tour of paradise, um, it's very striking that actually there's many women he mentions. The first saints that are described to Dante in paradise are women from the Old and from the New Testament. I think this is what Dante sees because he's now understanding salvation as incarnation. It's not to do with the old understanding of the cross, which you might say is a more masculine approach to understanding divine ways. He has now fully shifted to seeing it was all creation all along. God's emanation could do in a way nothing less. That is what grace is about. That's what this overflow of light and love is about. And from the human point of view, it's the feminine um, capability that enables that for things to be born inside, to grow, to flourish, to be manifest in a new life at birth. And so it's quite natural in fact that he sees female saints here 
um, present before him in paradise because that's what he has so fully become aware of. That is the manifestation of divine life that he sees. But it's also striking that even here in the penultimate canto, Dante has doubts. Um, Dante the poet actually uses the word, I think, three times across the course of this canto. Um, that's really crucial because it's constantly stressing that it's only through the process of doubt and then expansion of sight that lies on the other side of doubt, this tropological turning point, that paradise can be fully understood. If you think you've got it, it's already starting to slip away from you. A fact that's actually stressed by Bernard right at the end of this canto because he says to Dante, we must now pray to the Virgin in order to be carried to the final and fullest vision of which we're capable. You mustn't trust in your own wings, full and wonderful though they have become here in the high heavens. We must constantly be using what we know to step into what we don't know in order to discover more. And that is enacted out in Canto 32 by Dante's reference to doubt. Bernard sees it in his mind, of course, even without having spoken it. And the doubt that Dante has is that if paradise is so differentiated, he sees the differentiation between those who knew Christ, like the Virgin, those who were born or made before even the covenant, before the Jewish dispensation, like Eve. And then he also sees figures who were in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, Jewish dispensation, figures like Judith, figures like um, the mother of David. And how can those figures from those three very different periods of divine time, you might say, how can they all be here? This is Dante's old doubt returning, in fact, for a final last visit that's going to propel him into the high heavens, even as it's a question. It's the issue of justice. How can it be that nature, that which makes us human, meets grace, that which comes from the divine, so that everyone is saved, but everyone is saved in their own way? How can that particularity match the universality without introducing injustice? And Dante wonders whether he's seeing that at first glance in the literal glance tour of heaven because these different saints are in different places. I mean, it's compounded for him even more because he also sees here the children who died before they were able to accept grace consciously as adults before baptism. These are the children who many of Dante's contemporaries would have expected to see in limbo. Dante's radicality has always already moved them here to the paradise. And yet it raises the question for Dante of how these individuals can be saved, you might say by nature alone, by just the product of being born and not being able to consciously receive the grace. Whereas, for example, other saints that he sees now here before him are there because not just they were born, but because they have consciously received this grace. How can everybody here be present? And it's a great doubt to have because it both stretches Dante's vision and also means that that very dynamic of vision constantly being expanded is part and parcel of paradise. So too, our vision now, 700 years on, can be welcomed into that perception. You know, now we wouldn't just worry perhaps about those who were born before the Mosaic Covenant, those who are lived under the Mosaic Covenant, those who are Christian, how they are all saved, though that will be a concern. We would now wonder about other faiths, other dispensations, as Dante himself has when he has referenced the Ganges. He's fully aware that people were born outside of even awareness of Christianity, let alone considering it. And in fact, we've met people like that earlier in Paradise with Ripaeus, particularly, who he uses, I think, to indicate the expansion of vision that knows no bounds. Bernard says to him at this point, you know, marvel at God's plan, marvel at the extent 
of this garden. That is the tropological dynamic which we must embrace as much as what is literally seen. I'd even add another dimension of this vision's expansion because Bernard talks about different periods of time in terms of spiritual time as much as historical time. The time um, from the creation of Eden, the time from the Mosaic law, the time from Christ's life. And I think that allows us to say Dante would have expanded his vision had he been writing now to include also this evolution of consciousness, which I've referenced quite a few times across these podcasts. Um, this is the idea that the human individual themselves changes across these different eras of time. That is the meaning of these dis different dispensations. They're not just, as it were, accidents of history. They're part of the divine unfolding quite as much as Eve and Adam eating the apple are. They enable us to become at once more and more individual and particular, more and more knowing our I amness, in order that the divine I am can be consciously reflected and enjoyed and loved within us too. That is part of this salvation as incarnation, creation as constant outflowing. That is now reaching the greatest expression that Dante can give it, leaving us to fill in even more expression as we receive what he has written, filling in the vision ourself. I mean, put it like this, I think you can read the Inferno, the Purgatorio and the Paradiso themselves as three stages of individuality becoming capable of divinity. You might say that in the Inferno, individuals there are trapped in their individuality. They become so entangled with the particularity of their lives that they're unable to see the divine grace present through and behind it. That's what keeps them locked, frozen still in the deepest, darkest places of the Inferno. The purgatory represents a different stage where the individual becomes conscious of how their individuality has trapped them. But by seeing the ways in which they are trapped, they also discern the ways in which there's more than just than what they thought, that there was a life behind their life, um, that there was a greater being behind their particular being. And so by not losing touch with who they are, but by becoming aware of that they're more than who they are, they're gradually able to welcome into their individuality that which is more than they are. That's why purgatory takes some time. It's not just a click of the fingers, a magic transformation in which you suddenly become capable of the divine, because that would be to lose yourself. The whole point of the descent and the ascent being intimately linked is that everything is gathered up into the one vision. Nothing is lost. And as that unfolds in time, it takes time that I think it's actually the purpose of time, you might say, so that nothing can be lost and brought back into eternity, which is what happens in paradise, where the souls, although showing themselves to Dante in different planetary spheres, and even here in paradise, showing themselves to Dante in different parts of the celestial hierarchy, they are all now capable of the fullness of divine life as well. It is their particularity, which is the one pole that Dante sees, that enables them to appreciate the fullness of divine life as individual creations, as souls, as angels. Remember, Dante now sees their faces. He can move with his eyes all around this paradise, even as Bernard is describing it to him, with complete freedom that is something of what it's like to be both completely unique and at one with everything around you, with life, with being itself. If you can know that sense of separation without distinction, you can also know something of what it is to be free here in paradise, with its many expressions and with its full and complete joy that God, as Bernard explains, completely 
intends. That is the nature of grace. It's both at once God's knowledge of how this would be and our coming to knowledge of how this can be. Let me just read a few lines from Mark Muser's translation to get a direct sense of some of the lines from the canto. Um, this is where Bernard tells Dante that he must gaze once more on Mary's face, on she who is the archetype of God being born within us all, so that he can receive the joy of her life, feel that passion and love, and so have it fostered and kindled within him in his own particular expression of incarnate life. So Mark Muser translates Dante with Dante looking on Mary saying, I saw such bliss rain down upon her face, bestowed on it by all those sacred minds created to fly through these holy heights, that of all things I witnessed to this point, nothing had held me more spellbound than this, nor shown a greater likeness unto God, and that love which had once before descended now sang Ave Maria Grazia Plena before her presence there with wings spread wide. In those three tercets you get this dynamic of that which has descended is now sung again, ascended, Ave Maria Grazia Plena. Um, that which is both diverse in its flying through these holy heights is gathered together in the one, raining down bliss upon her face. Um, that which everything he's witnessed to this point He's sort of conscious of everything he's witnessed to this point, gathered together so that now it holds him completely spellbound in what he's seeing. He can see not just the multiplicity in paradise, but all that complexity that he'd encountered, incorporated, struggled with, transcended through his own journey. It's all active here, I think, here in Canto 32, crucial to understanding the canto and the vision it's trying to convey. The end of the canto brings another part of the tour that Bernard gives Dante. Again, you sort of left this sense that there could be endless tours of this endless place. But what's striking here is that Dante now sees various figures he's met at other parts of his journey, at other levels of God's creation, fully enjoying the fullness of God's creation now. So for example, he sees Peter. Um, he also sees Lucy. Remember St Lucy, who'd carried him up Mount Paradise and who had been part of the chain of feminine grace that had touched him when he was lost in the dark woods. It was Mary's prayer to Lucy, Lucy's prayer to Beatrice, Beatrice's arrival in, the, in, in limbo, speaking to Virgil who had come to find him in the dark forest. Um, Lucy is now seen by Dante. Um, building on this theme that he's gathering together all this vast experience and it's manifesting before him. And then Bernard says, but look, in spite of all that you have gathered, in spite of the full way that your wings have now grown, helping you to fly around these heights as well, know it within yourself, we must still turn to God in order to be able to reach the fullness of vision of which we're capable. The tropological, the doubt, expands his vision and yet the anagogic, the fourth level, always requires turning to receive that divine grace, constantly letting go in this dynamic of openness, reception and growth expansion. And so the canto ends with Bernard saying we must pray and Dante the poet telling us that this is how Bernard began his prayer. The prayer itself doesn't begin until canto 33 the last of the paradise. But that hiatus here at the end of Canto 32 is itself one full of meaning because it's saying for all the gathering that you now have active in your mind, in your imagination, in your sight, in your love, there's still a final jump that must be made to take on board in a single unified sight what divine life and human connection to divine life is about, and that he will attempt in the climax of the Divine Comedy.